All right, morning everybody. Good morning. Let's go to uh, Exodus, Exodus uh, chapter 3, and uh, looking at the uh, first 10 verses, Exodus 3, 1 through 10. So we entitled this, When God Calls Your Name, When God Calls Your Name, and this is a little excerpt from the life of Moses. Uh, so uh, part of where the trajectory of this goes is on uh, what we might call incarnational uh, living or incarnational ministry, and we're referencing Moses in terms of his uh, being influenced by the burning bush experience, and that's from uh, uh, these 10 verses, what we can read and, and draw from here. And uh, then we're going to make the connection uh, between uh, this and uh, Pentecost being a, a similar kind of uh, uh, occurrence uh, in the believer's life. Uh, we'll actually make that uh, co connection. Uh, so um, Exodus chapter 3, 1 through 10, uh, incarnational being this uh, fleshing out uh, uh, living. Uh, we think of the incarnation in terms of uh, our Lord and uh, his own being uh, life being a fleshing out of uh, the life of God in him, him he being a God in the flesh. Let's look at uh, Exodus 3, 1 through 10. It says, Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, uh, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mount of God. Uh, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, and yet the bush was not consumed. And so Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush, and he said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. And then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, well, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. For I am aware of their sufferings, and so I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and a spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. So all those Canaanite uh, tribes in the promised land or what would be the promised land. And verse 9 says, Now, behold, the cry of the sons of Israel have, have come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. And then verse 10, Therefore now come, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. I, I love that bit of irony there. Um, after, after leading up all these... I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. Behold, I'm sending you. <laughs> this is uh, uh, interesting. Uh, little little, little uh, turn uh, there that God gives him. I'm sure Moses uh, saying, it's wonderful, God, what you're going to do. And then, hey, go send you, Moses, uh, to, do that, to do that work. Um, this is uh, quite, a, quite a passage, right? So... Um, you know, you, you read this, and <clears throat> uh, if you're a literary guy, you're saying, well, okay, um, it's a narrative, it's a historical narrative, and you, you're going to read it as such and say, well, it's a story. Great. Okay, it's historical. It's going to lead up to um, uh, the Exodus. After all, that's what the name of the book is, the, the Exodus. You know, it's going to talk about the, how the Israelites came out of uh, their time of bondage in Egypt, and, and who led them, you know, Moses, and how did he get there, and how did all this come about, and all this is quite interesting, you know, get a little historical backdrop, but we're going to suggest there's a whole lot more, you know, going on there, and if you piece it together, and you have a little bit of help, too, because Luke, Luke finds this to be an, a compelling account, and of course, Stephen, of all people, right, Stephen, um, 
finds it so compelling that he's going he's gonna to die for it, right? It's because Stephen, as you know, was stoned uh, to death, <clears throat> and Saul, as a matter of fact, the Apostle, Apostle Paul, uh, <clears throat> is uh, authorized to, to uh, carry out the orders uh, with regard to that. And uh, so you have, you have all these things going on, right? So, so Luke is, is uh, writing the uh, further historical account in the New Testament and bringing this all into the uh, kind of the uh, his, historical lineage of the progression of the Christian movement. And, uh, and this on the lips now of Stephen, the martyr, and uh, Stephen then uh, using uh, this accounting of Israel's history uh, as though some type of a legal brief, bringing this against the, uh, as, as though bringing this as evidence to the, uh, to the council, you know, as he's brought before this, this uh, council of, of uh, uh, Jewish uh, high council and, and so on, right? And, and yet, uh, uh, Stephen doesn't just say, uh, I, I remind you, I remind you from the Torah, and if I could uh, refer you to chapter and verse, but he doesn't at all. Uh, he, he sort of does, but then he, he puts his own, uh, you know, commentary in there because Stephen is going to tell us he was this old then, and then he, how many years later, this, and he's actually giving us some uh, reference point uh, as far as dating, not so much the specific date on the chronological or on the calendar, but giving us some idea of the amount of time, and he, he puts that in there to give us some reference point in terms of, you know, uh, some, some arc of history. Uh, as to the, uh, the, the flow of all these things. And so even as Moses perhaps somehow a post-Exodus um, is writing, you know, these things, right? And yet such, such limited information, and I refer you back to chapter 2, which is quite, quite brief, of all the things that are happening here, and it takes you historically then, um, you know, from his... Uh, killing of the Egyptian to his flight, you know, flight from that to the, to the point where even Stephen is saying, well, he, he thought he was going to deliver. Hey, I'm the deliverer. I'm your deliverer. Look at me. I'm your deliverer. And then he's, he's fleeing off into the, to, into the wilderness. And all this is happening, and you mix that in with <clears throat> um, what is God seeing? What is God seeing? What is Moses doing? But what is God seeing? Uh, what is God hearing? What is God seeing? What does God propose to do uh, in all of this? You know, so you have this sort of um, historical perspective about things, 2, 24, and, and 25, for example, chapter just leading up to this, right? You have the headers, you know, uh, the burning bush, you know, over chapter 3 and verse 1, the burning bush. But before that, you know, God heard their groaning, and God remembered, and God saw, and God took notice, you know, this kind of thing. Um, and so Moses is writing all this after the fact, but at the time, Moses didn't know. Moses was too busy um, being in terror for his life and, and, and fleeing, being so humiliated because he thought, you know, he's, he's going to be the guy to, to deliver, you know, um, his, his people. And yet, um, you know, for all he knew, an abysmal failure and uh, uh, then fleeing Egypt um, for uh, obscurity, right? Obscurity uh, in the desert. And, and yet God at the same time, you know, is, is in, this, in this position. And then now we have this, this burning bush thing that we really have no idea about the passage of time and what's going on and, um, and what's, you know, Moses just, okay, he's there with uh, uh, Jethro. He's, he's going to be domesticated now and uh, have a wife and going to have some, some children, um, you know, tend a flock and so on. Um, so, you know, very scant on the detail. And so, so how is it that we, we see... Uh, God then intervening and when and, and how all of this happens and how much of that can we appreciate as to what God does in our life? Uh, how much of the past do we just say, yeah, I'm at this stage of life, you know, and here, you know, how old is Moses, right? You know, he's 
you know, 40 years and he does this, 40 more years pass on, he could easily just say, you know, I'm at this point where whatever I was going to be, that was, that's all, that's all ancient history. I'm, I'm pretty much resigned to being this now. Um, and you know, whatever, right? Whatever, whatever. I, I pretty much got uh, my course set um, and, and so on. Uh, all, those, all these assumptions about what, what life is, is going to be, but for that bush, you know, but for that, but for that thing, you know, um, you know. And so this is God, you know, this is God um, uh, showing up and God doing these things that he does um, and, and so on. So I think that it's, it's interesting, you know, these... Um, we don't, we're sort of trained uh, maybe in our school days, and not what I mean is the, from the, you know, the, the early school days when we're kids, you know, growing up and we are handed a history book and we open the history book and we just read it for what it is. And then we take a quiz or one of those things, you know, we go, okay, fine. And we do the true false or the multiple guess and we, we get through it and we go on to the next thing, you know. So, um, just the facts, the objective facts, and on we go. But to actually do the work of a historian or somebody to sit back and actually reflect upon that, I wonder, hmm, what if that did never happened? What would this? Or we, we start to think about history in, in, in terms of that. But then we get into the Word of God and we realize that uh, certainly this is, uh, we, we try to master Scripture, but then we think how brief, you know, how, even though, yeah, it's, it's a lot, but still, not much there, you know. We say, wow, it'd be interesting to have so much more detail. And yet we start to realize this is God selecting certain, certain things, and then we try to connect dots, and we try to, to, to surmise and understand and interpret from that. We try to interpret history in light of, um, in light of the nature of God as it is disclosed historically. You know, and, and we do see some of that, and we'll see some of that. So I try to hit this in a couple of, of parts here initially. You know, a couple of, of, of parts, this, this initial, a little bit of it. Um, and, uh, but uh, when you try to look and see how much of the nature of God will be disclosed to Moses um, uh, and, and, and even to us a little bit uh, historically, and we do learn a, a lot about God historically, how he acts it, uh, in, in history, but without getting too, too far afield, uh, um, just to consider some things here. But there's, a, there's an interesting text um, in Isaiah. This is Isaiah 43 and verse 1, which says, The Lord says uh, through the prophet Isaiah, you know, to his people, but, but now this is, this is what the Lord says, He who is your creator, Jacob, and he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. That's Isaiah 43 and verse 1. I say this because, you know, the God who calls your name, and this Moses' his name is repeated. Uh, we find this elsewhere. For example, um, you know, we would see this in um, uh, Abraham, although I'm not going to mention this right now, but Abraham 20, uh, Genesis 22, the occasion of Abraham and Isaac, you know, where he's going to put the skids on Abraham taking the life of Isaac and say, Abraham, Abraham. Remember, he repeats it. But also you have this um, occasion in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verses 4 through 8. Remember, this is young Samuel who's been uh, given over uh, to the, the service of the Lord in the, in the temple. And, uh, and here's young, young Samuel hearing his voice uh, Samuel, Samuel, interesting how it's, it's repeated, not just once, but twice. And here, Abraham, Abraham, here's Moses, Moses, and here's Samuel, Samuel. And, and here in, in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 10, if you were to look there, it actually says that uh, the Lord came and stood and called to the young boy. It, interesting how he's just hearing the voice, but then it's saying of this voice, uh, although you don't see a person are sort of like articulated there, the articulated shape of a person. It says, the Lord came and stood and called as if localized. So it's the language, I, I just use this word theophany if, if I could, but it's the language of revelation. 
is what it is. The language of revelation or theophany is, theophany is like a, what we'd call a localized appearance, you know, whether visible or auditory. It still could be auditory. Uh, whether experienced or, or in a conscious state or a waking vision, perhaps, or in a dream, or otherwise, you know, what something is otherwise transcended, invisible, non-spatial, or ever-present creator, this, this God, you know, that's a mouthful to say that. But, but here the Lord appeared um, uh, in the form of a man to Abraham on another occasion. That's Genesis 18, remember, with Abraham and Sarah, you know, and talking about how, you know, Sarah would have a child. Then remember, she kind of laughed within herself. So, hey, let's just call him Yitzhak, you know, which in Hebrew means laughter, right? Isaac, Yitzhak. So indeed, the angel of the Lord uh, appeared to Moses here in, in uh, three, Exodus 3 and 2 uh, <clears throat> in a flame that, that burned out of the midst, you know, Exodus chapter 3 and, and verse 2. So here's this appearing. So uh, God is, is revealing himself. Um, so making himself known, making himself visible, making himself seen. So something to say about that. I mean, imagine the creator... Uh, condescending to your to your realm, even to your state of of being, uh, to your language, in fact, to make himself knowable and to be known by you. This is no no small thing. You know, we we, we just skip over a lot of this in the Bible, but the very fact that God uh, makes himself known and knowable, and not just in some abstract kind of um, generalized sense, uh, but in a very real, personal, and particularized sense. Now, there's these Latin terms that are going to bless you, I'm sure, but there's this deus absconticus, is what we, we'd call it, or this, this unknowable God and deus revelatus, which is God who, who reveals himself. And the absconticus is the sense of the God in his essential being, which, which no one would ever know, uh, unless God actually created stuff, you know? So God is not uh, in any sense linked to that which he creates. Unless God created, he would just be not known by any thing because God in his essential nature is not thing or substance. bit philosophical, but still true. So God by creating and then and then not just creating um, some inanimate, unthinking something, but the very fact that God created something that was a sentient or thinking being, then did that for a purpose, so that that thinking being could, and, and not just a lower form of thought, but a higher form of thought, one that could reflect, one that could appreciate knowledge and could reflect on that uh, to make himself known. These are not small inferences. These are not small things. And then to, to, to say, I'll make myself known and I'll condescend to those beings and make myself known in such a way. I don't mean condescending in the way we use that term, like I'm, you're so condescending or something. Not, not like that, but condescending meaning a higher order to a lower order such that you can actually um, have the ability to know and understand and appreciate and apprehend and, and all such things, even just language. I'll, what, like, what, what kind of a bridge would it take for this, this God, this magnificent being, what kind of bridge would he have to build so that we could uh, enter into some kind of, a, of a relational knowledge of him? And so we would otherwise be ignorant of God's existence had he never created, had he never made himself known through his handiwork. Uh, the 19th um, uh, Psalm 19 and verse 1, for example, uh, this, this psalm, this psalm, 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 psalm 19 and verse 1, uh, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. So, um, and, and then you can, you can continue, you know, their voice is not heard, their line has gone out throughout. You can continue to go on through that psalm and, and, it, and it's basically going to say that there's something about the natural order of things that bear witness to 
um, the creator, the, the creator, which we say is how nature itself reveals God, but in a very general way. We don't know what kind of, of creator. We don't know anything about uh, uh, of God's personal qualities from, from that, uh, except that um, this must have been an, uh, some intelligence we might infer from, must have been some intelligence because uh, we, we say that certainly this, there's design. There's some design that must be some kind of designer, but, but nonetheless, um, f- for me, I, I'd say, well, this very fact of, of, of making himself known uh, is this idea of, of uh, the grace of God or putting the, the grace of God um, on display. And this would be um, a, a truly something of um, a, a work uh, on his uh, behalf. And, and I think of a passage uh, more akin to uh, a New Testament reality, but, but I think of God making himself known, something that he did not have to do, he didn't have to create, he didn't have to create beings. As dissatisfied as modern man is, you know, with his condition, as, as condemning of their creator, the ultimate form of condemnation is to deny the existence of such a being, right? But, but, but still, um, and, and yet to say that this is a, a sheer act of grace, you know, that you would even create beings capable of, of knowledge and capable of, of, of thought and be able to, uh, to understand um, their creator. And I think of a passage of like 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Um, uh, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and how so? And you know it because he's put this grace on display because uh, of, of an action that he took. What is that? Though he was rich, now here is the condescension, a higher level to a lower level. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became what? Poor, that you through his poverty might be elevated to the higher level, might become rich. And then I, I, uh, I think also of, of Titus chapter 2 and... Uh, just with that same uh, idea of, of grace and action associated with it, within the limitations of that, Titus chapter 2, for the grace of God has appeared, how so? Because it brought salvation to all men, teaching us that um, to, to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live sensibly, uh, righteously, godly in this present age, and so on. So, Again, God is not a thing and therefore is not subject to the immutable laws of nature nor accessible by the things which exist in this natural realm. We couldn't possibly access him unless he wanted to be accessible. We we couldn't do it. That is, unless he freely chooses to disclose himself, he remains outside of nature, his existence discernible by uh, nature, but but his essential nature as a personal being remains remains unknown uh, unless he wants to be known. And so his gra- by his grace, he makes, himself, he makes himself known. And I look at passages like uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and 1 through 3, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many por- uh, portions, and in many ways in these last days has spoken to us, how? In his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he has made the world, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. And when he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of his majesty on high. So it's interesting, the, when you look at the burning bush, for example, and you see the, um, the fact that this is a revelation of God, this is the localized here, but in, in a sense that here's God revealing himself, revealing himself uh, to Moses. And then when you see, for example, uh, the incarnate son of God, right? So you have Jesus, uh, uh, the creator God, John 1.1, 1, 1, became flesh, John 1.14, and we beheld his 
glory. And then you have the same thing in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. And it's interesting uh, to see how these terms uh, align in that particular sense. You'd be able to, to see this. And this is John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 8, um, and how the person of Jesus, according to John chapter 1 uh, and verse 18, has exegeted, uses this term, has, has exegeted what, uh, who God is for us. Um, Colossians chapter um, 1 and verse 15 uh, also, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So in Jesus, therefore, we see God in the flesh or the incarnation of the creator and sustainer of all things. But, but something as simple as a name, a name, voice from the lips of God, a deeply personal God, is most interested in the loving pursuit of of the individual rather than the judicial consignment of, of the race. Just something about speaking the name of an individual. So that's not a small observation either. So what we're saying here is that while the race, the race as a whole is consigned to a woeful spiritual uh, condition, you know, you have a passage like uh, Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed in all the world. So that sounds like the consignment of the whole race, right? So that every mouth, the whole world may become accountable to God. But God's pursuit of the individual is intended to rescue ruined lives from certain irreversible um, and eternal destruction. And we look at a familiar passage like John chapter 3 and verse 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God did not uh, send the son into the world to, uh, to judge the world but that the world might be saved through him, that he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light nor fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. So this is the language of redemption. And the Apostle Paul describes sin as a deadly contagion that infected the race uh, as a whole through one man such that the reality of the entire race now, now um, existing as sinners bears witness. So John chapter, or sorry, Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. And this is reminiscent of the language used by uh, the prophet uh, Jeremiah, for example, and Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, where Jeremiah says that the heart uh, is deceitful above all things and desperately sick, so the New American Standard will render it. Um, so this is anash in Hebrew, or it's a metaphor that refers to an incurable or terminal illness. So just as the relation of the one to the all uh, is indicative of the complete ruin of the race. And this is how Paul, um, you know, vets this all out in Romans chapter 5. So the salvation of the race would come by the same one-to-all relation, but with a different result. For example, in Romans chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, he says, So then, as through one transgression, 
that resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one the many will be made righteous. So um, this distinction being that we were all sinners by virtue of one man's disobedience, but we may all be justified through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is uh, Romans chapter 3, uh, verses 23 uh, through 25, uh, where Paul says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. And he goes on uh, to describe this further. But the all are consigned to condemnation, but for the pursuit of the lost and otherwise ruined individual. You remember Jesus said, um, this is just in the context of going to the household of that publican um, Zacchaeus, where he says in Luke 19 and 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Um, but this one, uh, the lost sheep over whom heaven rejoices, having found. And you see this in um, these three successive parables that Jesus tells in Luke uh, chapter 15. And so the cross permits the individual sinner to seek refuge from the storm of God's judgment upon the guilty race now redeemed through the shed blood of God's worthy lamb. You remember um, John the Baptist saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away uh, the sin of the world. So the pursuit of one lost sinner. So how significant that God would single us out one one by one. Um, I think of uh, Psalm, the eighth Psalm and the fourth verse, which may not be entirely on the nose for this, but it is uh, interesting um, how it's phrased. Psalm 8 and verse 4, uh, the third verse says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man, that you care for him. Just noting that he's not saying this in a general, what is mankind? What is humanity? But what is man singular? All those in the Hebrew being rendered singular. But what is it to personally apprehend the immediate presence of God and to experience the imparted power of God? When I look at Moses and others, I mean, just similar, uh, to be able to um, encounter God in this way, um, the immediate presence of God, the, the imparted power of God, which certainly God was trying to convince him, you know, I'm going to be with you, I'm going to give you everything you need, and certainly we, uh, uh, as New Covenant believers, uh, understand this uh, in a, in a um, direct and, and personal sense. But there are several operative words, uh, I think, that are um, in, in, in this question, maybe, such as like personal apprehension. What do we mean by that? But the ability to grasp what otherwise would be, would be unknown, you know, that God makes himself uh, known to us in this way. God desires to be known and not at some uh, distance that's unattainable to human approach, but in close proximity and to lone individuals and to us, to me, to personalize that, um, truly, personal apprehension. I mean, the idea that God wants to know you personally, as much as he says Moses, he wants to know you and you by name. Immediate presence, to say that, the immediate presence of, of God confirms that God is not some archaeological discovery or a museum piece or traceable from a point of um, some previous location. No, he is, he is present now, and his presence is capable of immediate and realized experience. You're not on some 
journey with a GPS or a map to, and God is the destination um, somewhere. Or imparted power uh, is that which is bestowed by God to be appropriated in order to perform appointed works of service on his behalf. So, um, you know, this is, this is part of the narrative and this is part of understanding um, not just that this is a cool story about how God showed up, uh, found Moses, and, you know, sort of turned his life around and then got Moses directed in the, in the right place. Moses went, was used of, of God, according to God's power. God did some great miracles, and these people were delivered. But there's a whole sort of um, understanding of the mindset of God that is put on display here and how Moses was instrumental in being used to help actuate God's plan. In other words, all this is deeply suggestive of a missional God and the missional mindset on the part of, of God. When you think of a passage that we just read, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, you know, this idea of God sending you know first john 4 14 the father sent the son to be the savior of of the world jesus said to his uh, uh, disciples as the father has sent me and then he uses this phrase in the greek ego apostello i am sending you he uses the, the emphatic putting the ego in front of that i am sending you you know i i've been sent and in so doing i'm sending you because this is the missional nature of God. So, so in other words, it isn't just the fact that God empowers, but God only empowers for one reason. God, God strengthens, but he only strengthens for one reason. In other words, God has this, this um, plan, you know, and it is this redemptive plan from a missional God. So it's a unique message of Christianity, the message that sets Christianity apart from all other so-called faiths, and that's the incarnation or the entrance of God into humanity. And more than God taking human flesh to redeem a fallen race, it is the initiative, the initiative taken by God. In other words, the sending, what did it take to do that? It took the sending of his son, and this is deeply missional. So too is our mission, our sending into the world of humanity, our incarnation of, of the message. So you, you go to that hilltop where he's going to ascend to the right hand of the Father, um, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Um, you shall receive power, there's the empowering, after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses, there's the missional. You shall, you shall be, you're going to be driven out. That's that's Acts 8, 4, and they went everywhere preaching. You know, this is, this is all driving out, 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 go, 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 send, 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 and that's the impetus. That's the ever uh, leeching out of, of the message and those concentric circles of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ever going, going, going. Um, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14, I find a, an in, interesting a little aside here, but it's a, uh, yet another testimony to the missional nature of God uh, in creation. And you say, well, how so? But if you look at uh, Hebrews chapter 1, 14, are they not all his ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? I thought it's just interesting because... You know, God actually creates beings and they have one function and this is it. Here's a whole order of being. You got one function. What's that? Angelos. I mean, this is what we, this is so the, the Greek term is angelos. So we just transliterate it and that's where we get angel from. You just transliterate it. Angelos equals angel and angel means what? It's just, if we translate it, uh, it translates, you know, somebody who's a, a messenger. It's a heavenly messenger. And there, there are other places with, with reference to a human. Now, there are, most of the time in the Bible, it's, you know, if the term is used, it's with reference to a, a, um, 
heavenly messenger, it's an angel, but we don't translate it angel if it's for a human, <laughs> you know. So it's usually like a, somebody who's dispatched, you know, to, to perform some task, but that's the idea. That's exactly the idea. Uh, you know, if you're an angelos, that's, get out there and do it. It's, it's your idea. And this, this, is the, this, is, this is the notion. This is, a missional, this is a missional God. So we have a creator. We have a creator who's, who's not a theoretician. You know, he doesn't, let's, let's gather a group. Let's, let's workshop this out in a think tank. You know, he's, this is a creator who's a, he's a, he, he, he's a creator. You know, so he does, he works, he does. So all you artisans, you get it, right? So you're, you're, you're doers. You know, you don't sit around and say, hmm, let's, uh, let's, let's think about, let's think about this. You know? So yeah, there's a certain amount of thought and planning, but it's, it's, let's, let's, let's go. Let's, let's, let's go, let's go, let's do, let's do. So there's the sending, the sending, the sending, the sending, the sending. And uh, you, you just see Jesus with his disciples. You know, this is the sending. But there's the next, you know, hey, there's the next, there's the next town, right? Isn't that Jesus? You can imagine this, right? You, you don't have to imagine it, but you read it. There's always the next town. There's the next town over the hill. There's the next town. There's the next town. There's the next street. There's the next, the next, the next. And you get this sense. It's a, it's a missional. And so you'd expect that of Jesus, right? Because he's God, right? So God is this missional, missional God. And what it took to bring the Son of God into this world, um, it was sending, sent. So in order for him to come and to be the redeemer of mankind, he had to be sent. But we don't want to miss the idea of the sending because that's what a missional God does. He commissions, he sends, go, go, go. This is the idea. So God makes himself known to those he encounters and he empowers to declare through demonstrative works, in other words. Those works that he permits us to do are to put his power on display. That's this incarnational living, this, this incarnate. So when he, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Um, going, teaching, baptize, all these, all these kinds of things. It's, it's in, in that type of activity. Are we, are, we, are we making disciples of all nations? And this is the unceasing missional plan of God uh, through the ages. The certainty of knowing God and living each day in the fullness of the confidence of being known by him are essential um, to, to the life of, of faith. And so we'll see this, we'll see this a little bit uh, more in Moses. So pick up here um, next time. Lord, uh, thank you for uh, letting us uh, get a little uh, bit into the life of Moses and see a little bit of, of yourself uh, in and through this. We thank you for, uh, truly, for uh, your son uh, being sent in, into this world as we go out. Uh, into that very same world uh, this week. Let us understand we are, we are sent ones as well, uh, ones sent with a, with a message, to, to be sure, but one that should be visible in our own lives, not just uh, words that come from our lips, but um, evidence that people see uh, that is, is a, a testimony from our lives. Thank you, uh, Lord, for what um, you, you do for us and in caring for us. Uh, and strengthening us uh, for this day and the week to come. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.